Oh, sorry, did I not do that one? Revenge? Yeah, that's cool. I don't know that she necessarily wants him to kill Richard, but I did accept that as an answer. But she wants him to get revenge on Richard for killing, for being responsible for the death of um, Can Gloucester. Can we expect these questions on a midterm, final, something like that? Well, because I had to change the exam from in class to take home, you're probably not going to get objective questions for the take home because that'd be too easy to go to a Shakespeare encyclopedia and look it all up. Um, but I don't know. They, they might show up somehow, somewhere. Okay, so we left off, I think, in Act 3, Scene 3. Uh, 766, 767. That's where I have a yellow sticky note. But if you notice, my book has several yellow sticky notes. So I'm not actually sure that that's the right... Does that sound right? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, we we talk um, about Richard's long speech in on the in the previous act in excuse me in the previous scene where he mentions the hollow crown and such, and we see um, Scroop come in and say York is now joined with Bolingbroke. Okay, and. Richard finishes 3-2 saying, he does me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. No more flattery. No more yes words. Okay? Let them hence away from Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. What is Richard suggesting there? Well, let me back, that, let me back up. Has anybody so far on Bolingbroke's side suggested the idea of deposing the king and making Henry Bolingbroke the new king. No. In fact, you hear Northumberland, you know, swear. We have sworn an oath to him to help him do what? Get his titles back. Anybody who breaks that oath you know, have certain things happen to him. And the breaking the oath can, can mean not only not helping him get his land's titles back, but also going beyond that oath. Question? Oh, no. Okay. So, 3-3 three, three opens up with Bolingbroke coming in with York, Northumberland, and others. And we hear Bolingbroke say, now this is pretty important, um, to conclude what I was saying with the part about Richard. Let them hence away from Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. It was Richard's last line before scene three. Richard's night, Bolingbroke's day. What is Richard suggesting is eventually going to happen? Bolingbroke's going to replace him. Richard's night means my time is falling. Bolingbroke's day, his time is rising. So, Bolingbroke. So that by this intelligence we learn, the Welshmen are dispersed. Salisbury's gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some new, with some few private friends, friends upon this coast. Northumberland. Okay. So Bolingbroke hasn't said any there, other than the Welsh are dispersed, and Richard has landed back in England with some few private friends. R uh, Northumberland. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Now, my lord doesn't mean Bolingbroke is higher. This is a term of equals. They refer to each other as my lord. But then Northumberland says, Richard not far from hence hath hid his head. If you read the Wall Street Journal, if you read the Washington Post, if you read the New York Times, all three of those publications, and most other major news, newspapers, afford what to the current holder of the presidency? And, and I don't mean current Donald Trump. I mean whoever is president at the time that you know the publication is writing about. They always say president. They always say president. 
Why? Respect. Is it respect of the individual holding the office? No. It's the office. Okay. What has Northumberland just done? He didn't call him king. In Northumberland's mind, apparently, especially we get this if we look at York's comments immediately following, he's not even calling him king because in his mind, that's done. That's over. It would be seem the Lord Northumberland to say, King Richard. It would be appropriate to, you know, you could throw in the adverb, still call him king. And notice, he doesn't say, it would be seem Northumberland. What does he do? He calls him Lord. He gives him the title that is due him by what? inheritance. Well, Richard is still due the title given him by inheritance, king. Alack the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. York, even though Scroop said York has joined Bolingbroke, has he really? And what does joining Bolingbroke mean? Are they out and out open rebels? No, they have, they're not. Okay. Well, not yet they're not. Maybe within a few lines. Northumberland, y your grace mistakes. I didn't mean to misspeak. Only to be brief, left I his title out. Really? <laughs> like, how long does it take to say king? York. The time hath been. Would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief, brief with you to shorten you for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Now, notice Shakespeare punning there. If I haven't said it before, I'll say it now. If there's a possible pun, even as tenuous as it might be, Shakespeare will go for that pun. Okay? This is one of the things that so bothered later writer, Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson, about Shakespeare. He essentially said, Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't like. Johnson didn't care for punning. Okay? He thought it was a low form of kind of intellectual humor or intellectual wordplay. So what's York said? He would have been so brief. Do you want to talk about briefness? It wouldn't have taken Richard Long to do what? To shorten you. How? For taking so the head, that is, the title of king, he would have what? Taken your head. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Bolingbroke is saying, come on, uncle, you're reading too much into that. Imagine if these guys lived today with this thing and the internet and CNN parsing every syllable. Take not, good cousin, York replies, further than you should. Now, he doesn't mean cousin that Bolingbroke is his cousin. How's he using cousin? Distant relation. Uncle to nephew. That is a distant relation. Lest you mistake the heavens are over our heads. Don't forget God. In other words, you, you can't just kind of be brief with words. Why? Words mean things, right? Words have consequences. Words can be cause for violent action. The old children's adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me? Bullshit. <laughs> that is a lie. Okay? Because names have literally caused wars. So, Bolingbroke, I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. I know, and I'm not opposed to the will 
of heaven. Well, what, according to what we've been saying previously, what is the will of heaven? King Richard. King Richard. God anointed Richard through the hands of the Archbishop. Bolingbroke is saying, I'm not opposed to that. All right? So, Harry Percy comes in, and there's some little talk back and forth. And Percy tells Bolingbroke, the castle royally is manned, my lord, against the entrance. Bolingbroke, royally? Why, it contains no king. Percy, yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of young lime, lime and stone, and with him are the lord Almeryl, Salisbury's group, etc. Bolingbroke didn't know that King Richard was in that castle, and so Percy tells him. Okay, so... When, are they just talking about some old castle just off in the distance? No, they're talking about a castle that Bolingbroke and his men are getting ready to lay siege to. And he's, Percy says, um, the king's there, so if they're getting ready to lay siege, to besiege this castle, what does that mean? They're getting ready to fight the king. Northumberland. Oh, be like it's the Bishop of Carlisle. He's talking about to the men of reverence that Percy says he cannot name. So, Bolingbroke turns to Northumberland. Noble Lord, go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle. The rude ribs. He's talking about the flying buttresses on the outside that help support the walls and such. Go to the rude ribs, probably that's what he's referring to, of that ancient castle, through brazen trumpet, send the breath of parley into his ruined ears, and thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke on both his knees doth kiss King Richard's hand, and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come, even at his feet, to lay my arms and power, provided that. What's provided that mean? Is it but? Under the condition, if, as long as, so I will kneel down to you, I will lay my, um, at your feet lay my arms in power, I will send allegiance and true faith of heart, if, what? My banishment be repealed. My lands restored be freely granted. What kind of, what kind of offer is this? A good one for Richard. Good offer for Richard? Think about it, though. Think about it. If. Introduces a conditional clause, right? A condition, it's a subjunctive. Contrary to fact. Every conditional is subjunctive. Why? Because it's not the reality now. That's why it's if. If wishes were dollars, I'd be a billionaire. But I'm not. <laughs> because they're not. So, look at the offer again. Remove yourself from 2018. Put yourself into the mindset, the worldview of 1399. Who has all the power? The king. There should be no if. Okay, so when I say who has all the power, what kind of power does that refer to? Is it physical power of force of arms? No. It's what? Authority. See, authority has nothing to do with who has the biggest weapons. Authority has to do with who has the right to power. Richard has that. Because of the will of the heavens. Bolingbroke doesn't. Bolingbroke apparently, however, has what? A lot of armor. Raw physical power. Okay. 
He's got, a, you know, a few thousand Chris Hemsworth armed to the gills. Or maybe I should mix my metaphors. Aquaman, you know, armed to the gills, so to speak. But from our perspective, it looks like a pretty good offer. Yeah, I'll bow down. I'll kiss your feet. I'll swear allegiance. Give me back what's mine. If not, that is, if he won't repeal my banishment, I'll use the advantage of my power. I've got your castle essentially encircled. And lay the summer's dust with showers of blood rain from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. That is, we will water the dry, parched ground with the blood of of Englishmen. This is one Englishman speaking to another. I will open what? Civil war. The which, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is such crimson tempest should be drenched the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land my stooping duty tenderly, tenderly shall show. Those last four lines all mean what? I don't want to, don't make me. He's saying, I, I, I just, you know, it's kind of like Theseus. All I want is the little changeling child. He's saying, all I want. One, to have the banishment repealed. What else? To get my land and title back. That's it. Okay. Of those claims, does he have a right to claim any of those? So before you think about it, he does some of those. Of those, what does he have a right to? His Title, his inheritance. He doesn't have a right to ask to have his banishment repealed. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. But he does have a right to the title of Duke of Lancaster. Now, notice, Bolingbroke's kind of, you know, what we saw earlier, you know, I was banished Hefford, I come back, he's, he's saying, you know, the Duke of Hefford was banished. I mean, guess what? He still is. But I'm not him anymore. I'm now Lancaster. Yeah, he's kind of playing on words there. Okay? So, go signify as much while here we march upon the grassy carpet of this plain. While here we march, what are they going to do while Northumberland brings this embassy to Richard. Kind of like war games. They're going to, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, this is Sauron showing Denethor all the might of Mordor through the Palantir. They're going to show Richard how many troops they have. So that as Northumberland on bended knee is making this offer, Richard can look over Northumberland's shoulders and see thousands of well-armed troops. What, what does the marching on the plane serve as? It has a show of power, but not the right to power, but physical power. It's like they're pretending to have humility, but really they know that they can kind of take it. Okay, is it, is it pretential, if that's even a word? Pretend humility? I mean, is, is Bolingbroke being honest here? Because I'll tell you, from a professor I worked with when I was working on my PhD, he, I never had Shakespeare from him, but he taught Shakespeare. He said, you know, back in the 70s, when he first began teaching, everybody looked at Bolingbroke like Richard Nixon. This guy was just a schemer and conniver. Well... Maybe if you're on a certain side of the political spectrum. I was not on that side of the political spectrum. I don't see Bolingbroke that way. I see his offer here as an honest, genuine offer. But it has the threat of what behind it. Violence. Take my offer, I'm going <laughs> to take Or I'll take it. <laughs> I will take it from you. I will take my titles, etc., back. 
Okay? He goes on. It says, let's march without the noise of threatening drum. So we're going to march, but we're not going to be banging the drums and such. That from this castle's tottled, tottered battlements, our fair appointments may be well perused, so that they can see us. Methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water. We should meet like fire and water. What happens when fire and water meet? Water wins? Depends, right? Doesn't it depend on how much fire and how much water? If pet call catches fire, you come up with a squirt gun. <laughs> Not going to do any good. Okay? Similarly, if, you know, this sheet of paper catches fire and you come in with a four-alarm fire call and a hundred firemen and a bunch of tankers, that's a bit overkill. He's saying... We should meet like fire and water when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. He's talking like a thunderstorm, fire and water. Rain, lightning, be he the fire, I'll be, notice, the yielding water. What does it mean to yield? I mean, we, we have that phrase today because of medieval knighthood. Like when you get on the highway, you're on an on-ramp, the highway's going like this. What must you do? A lot of people don't realize this apparently. The person entering the highway yields, not the people going 65, 80, 95 down the highway or on the old fort, you know, wherever it is. He says, I will yield. The rage be his, whilst on the earth I rain my waters. On the earth and not on him. Okay? So, they see King Richard. He himself doth appear as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east. When he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and to stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident. That is, I see Richard, and he appears how? As doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east. It's not like he's appearing in his full glory. It's like every now and then it's foggy or cloudy in the morning, and you can see the disk of the sun, and the fog or cloud will lift, and then it what? Dazzles you, and then the clouds come back over. York. Yet looks he like a king. Why? Because he has the crown? Because he's wearing ermine? Behold, his eye, as bright as is the eagle's, lightens forth controlling majesty. And when Shakespeare wanted to pull out all the stops and give you an image, nobody does it better. Did, we don't have an equal in our political system to this kind of life. I don't care who the president is. Maybe Washington could have this kind of effect. Because what's he saying? It's like seeing the eye of God. It's like Moses come down from Mount Sinai. And everybody just... Why? Majesty. Inherent majesty. Alack, alack for woe that any harm should stain so fair a show. This is York. Living, following, believing entirely in the tradition. Saying, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be doing this. And Richard comes to Northumberland. We are amazed. What does it mean to be amazed? Replace amazed with a word that often gets used as a synonym for amazed, astonished. Astonished means literally, take my history of the English language course in the spring, means literally to be turned to stone. We are frozen. And thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king, 
And if we be, <laughs> and if I am the king, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? What is Northumberland not doing? He's not yielding. He isn't kneeling. Now, in Shakespeare's day, this play is written around 1599 or so. But if you lived 60 years previous, 1539, and Henry VIII came in your presence, and you didn't bend the knee, you would be dead. Literally. In fact, if you did bend the knee and you had your face to the ground and Henry came by and you looked up, some accounts suggest that was cause for death. Why? You don't look at the king. The king is so far, especially if you're a commoner, the king is so far above you. But even if you're a noble, you don't look at the king unless the king addresses you directly by name. That's the idea of majesty imbued in the person of the monarch. Okay? It's one of the reasons why George Washington, a couple hundred years after Henry VIII, I almost said gave up the crown, <laughs> gave up the presidency, or wanted to, after his first term in office. Why? He didn't want to die in office. Because he knew, if I die in office, guess what the presidency becomes? Job for life. In which case, it then gets handed down, even though the Constitution says there's election, it then gets handed down to your children. Thank God, Washington didn't have his own children. So, to pay their awful duty to our presence, if we be not, that is, if we be not the king... Show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. When did, when did God remove me? He's saying. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our scepter unless he do. If some hand of blood and bone grabs, he says, my royal scepter, he will what? He will profane why? Because the scepter is sacred. It is a holy object. He will profane, he will steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet no, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf. Armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot, excuse me, that lift your vessel hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Now, what has Richard just launched into? Okay, preacher mode, what else? You touch me, you're going to hell kind of thing. It's bravado, right? It's threat. What's the problem? He doesn't have an army, but he says God's army will come to his defense. Is this empty threat? In the sense that Richard can call down legions of angels? Like Christ said just before the crucifixion, he could. He might think he can. Why didn't he do it in Ireland then? Okay. Tell Bolingbroke, for yon methinks he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. Well, how many every stride has he taken from when he first landed at Ravensburg to now? Northeast to southwest England. It's like New York, L.A., that's a lot of steps. <laughs> That's a lot of treason. He has come to open the Purple Testament of bleeding war. Why Purple Testament? The royalty. He's come to kill me. 
But ere the crown he looks for live in peace, 10,000 bloody crowns of mother's sons. The crown he looks for, that is the hollow crown that Richard spoke about, the crown of state, before that can, look, can live in peace, he means on Bolingbroke's head, 10,000 bloody crowns, heads, of mother's sons shall it become the flower of England's face. Change the complexion of her May pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pasture's grass with faithful English blood. Northumberland, God forbid that our Lord the King should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. No, 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 that's not we're here. We're not here to deprive you of your kingship. His coming, 112, hither hath no further scope, no further scope. This is the limit of what he wants. Then for his lineal royalties, lineal by his lineage, royalties, because he's related to royalty, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees. Enfranchisement, that he can come back. Notice, could Richard go, I'll give him his title and lands, all that kind of stuff, but he has to fulfill the rest of his banishment. He could. Would Bolingbroke take it? Hmm. Which, on thy royal party, granted once his glittering arms, he will what? Commend to rest. Give him his titles back, repeal the banishment, and Bolingbroke will do what with all these thousands of soldiers? Go home. Go home. His barbed steeds to stables and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince unjust. And as I am a gentleman, I credit him. That is, and because I'm a gentleman, I believe him. Northumberland say thus the king returns. That is, this is what the king says in reply to Bolingbroke. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. His fair demands. So, who gets to decide what's fair and what isn't fair? God? The king? Bolingbroke? Because I'll bet you Bolingbroke's notion of fairness and Richard's notion of fairness are a little bit different. Notice, they both have an idea of fair, a standard. It's just how they apply that standard might be a little bit different. With all the gracious utterance that I speak to his gentle hearing, kind commends. I kind of like your speech, Northumberland. So, go tell Henry, I accept. Let, let him give me his demands. Okay. So, Northumberland and his attendants go off to Bolingbrook and Yoke. And he says to Almero, the king does, We do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not? to look so poorly and to speak so fair. Why does he look so poorly? Well, he's just gotten back from war. And what else? He's not dressed as king. He's not in his normal kingly attire. Shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor and so die? Notice Richard's telling us, if I don't agree to his demands, I'm dead. I'm Errol. No, good my lord. Let's fight with gentle words time till time lend friends and friends their helpful swords. What's so Merrill saying? What do they need? Time. Why? To gather support. That ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth, cajolery, cajolery, flattery. 
Notice, he doesn't want to do this. Why? Because he was wrong? No. Because he's forced to. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name. The name not being Richard II. The name being King. He's kind of saying, it really sucks to be the one in power. Because you have to do things you don't want to do. And you can't do things you might want to do. Or that I could forget what I have been. Or not remember what I must be now. Swellst thou proud heart. Heart. The seed of passion. Swellst thou. Are you full of yourself? I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. So, Northumberland comes back and the king addresses him. What must the king do now? Notice the question tells you, essentially, Richard is acknowledging what? It's over. It's over. Why? If the king could be compelled, is the king king? No. Must he submit? The king shall do it. And, and he brings it up. Must he be deposed? Notice, has Northumberland said anything yet? He's gone off, he's talked to Bolingbroke, he comes back. And before he even gets to say, Hail, your mighty grace, must I be deposed? The king shall be contented. He just threw that out there. And what did he say? Cool. I'm fine with that. Must he lose the name of king? In God's name, let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads. What does he mean by beads? Kind of like this thing. If I can get it off. Prayer rope. A Catholic set of rosary breeds. Beads. Okay? My gorgeous palace for a hermitage. My gay apparel for an almsman's gown. Gay there means rich apparel. For what? A rough woven tunic. That's it. My figured goblets for a dish of wood. My scepter for a palmer's walking staff. Palmer a pilgrimage, a pilgrim. My subjects for a pair of carved saints. Kind of like icons. And my large kingdom for a little grave. A little, little grave. An obscure grave. Or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade, where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head. For on my heart they tread now, whilst I live. And buried once, why not upon my head? A uh, Meryl, thou weeps, my tender-hearted cousin. We'll make foul weather with despised and tears. Our sighs, and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wantons with our woes and make some pretty match with shedding? What's the purpose of this whole speech? This is one of the speeches, by the way, that Bevington was referring to, talking about how Richard shows, you know, awareness of the faults that he has. And he puts that awareness in beautiful poetic language. In Therian laid, there lies two kinsmen dig their graves with weeping eyes. Would, would not this ill do well? Well, well, I see, I talk but idly, and you laugh at me. So, most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard live to leave till Richard dies? He's already assuming here, I'm going to be deposed. Will he let me live out my life to a ripe old age? Northumberland, my lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down? That is, 
in, in, in the kind of common area. Down, down I come. Richard takes descending the stairs to be what? Descending from on high. To be descending from majesty to commoner. Like glistering faith and wanting the manage of unruly jails. In the base court? He's playing on court here like the court of state. In the common court? Like a pub? Base court where kings grow base? To come at traitors' calls and do them grace? In the base court? Come down? Down court. Down king. So they join Bolingbroke. What says his majesty? Okay, he calls him his majesty. Why? He's still king. Sorrow and grief, uh, Northumberland replies. So Bolingbroke tells everybody else, stand apart. He's going to stand and talk with the king. Stand apart, stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty. And he kneels, my gracious lord. Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart feel, might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. In other words, get up off your damn knee, because I know you don't really mean it. I wish I felt it in here. That is, I wish I felt your real love and courtesy rather than this simple sign. Up, cousin. Your heart is up, I know. <laughs> Thus high at least. And he touches his crown. He's al it's almost like he's saying, get up, Bolingbroke. You want it. Take it. My gracious Lord, I come but for mine own. And what my professor, what my um, guy worked for, the way he would interpret that is that Bolingbroke's way of saying, you're right, I do want that. That should be mine. I don't think the text supports that. Okay? Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all. Well, how is all Bolingbroke's? <clears throat> Again, what has Richard been saying for the last 30 plus lines? He's the king. He might not be king in name yet, but he sure is acting like the king. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as my true service shall deserve your love. They well deserve to have that know the strongest and surest way to get. Look at that line again. They well deserve to have. They deserve well to have. Replace that. They deserve well to get. What? Who know the strongest and surest way to get. If you know how to achieve your goals, then you well deserve to achieve those goals. That's what he's saying. And he's kind of going, well done, Tolly. That's a, pardon my language, ballsy move. You knew what you wanted and you just went for it. All right. They talk a bit more. And we're going to... Um, now nah, i got to do this. He goes on. He speaks to York who weeps. Uncle, give me your hands. Hey, dry your eyes. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. That is... Tears show love, but tears don't do what? They can't fix anything. So quit your crying. What needs to be fixed? This whole relationship's all screwed up. He looks to Bolingbroke. Cousin, I'm too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give and willing to. What you'll have. Title, inheritance, 
Repeal of banishment? Yours. For do we must what force will have us do. Chaucer has a line where he says, um, it's in the Knight's Tale, something about mocking a virtue of necessity. You must make a virtue of necessity. What does that mean? If it's a necessity, then you don't have any will in the matter, right? It's forced upon you. He's saying you need to learn to make that kind of situation into a virtue. That is, you turn it around. How? By opposing it? Shut By opposing it? No. By learning to go back to Aesop, the fable of the mighty oak and the reed. The big storm comes, and what happens? The reed bends with the storm and comes back. And the mighty oak, boom, and is dead. Okay. The necessity is the wind. The virtue, rolling with it. Taking those punches and getting back up. For what we must, for do we must what force will have us do. He's saying, I can't oppose you. Therefore, I will do what you ask willingly. Set on towards London, cousin. Is it so? That is, we're heading towards London, right? Why? It's the capital. Keep going. Heads of state are sworn in where? Westminster, Westminster Abbey. He's... He's reading ahead going, I know what you're planning. <laughs> Even though Bolingbroke hasn't said anything, and Bolingbroke says, yeah, my good lord, then I must not say no. Uh, three, four, we have the queen and a lady talking, and some men come in, gardeners come in, and what do we hear? And we're not going to talk about this scene really much. They say, the gardener, line 54, Bolingbroke hath seized the... Wasteful king. Why is the king wasteful? Go back to the opening scene of the play. He had spent liberally the treasures of, or the treasury of the crown. Oh, what pity is it that had he not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. And he calls the land a garden just like John of Gaunt called England a garden. The only problem is what has happened to England under Richard's reign. It has become weed-filled and rank and rotted. The gardener's job is to do what with the garden? Keep the weeds out. Keep the plants producing. Okay? But what does a good gardener have to do? If you've ever gardened, my dad owned for a while, uh, had a landscaping business. My brother and I in most of the work. What, you know, what must you do in order to have apple trees, for example, that will produce fruit? You got to prune them. Especially if you want to produce a lot of fruit. That means what? Not just cutting back dead wood. Because dead wood doesn't harm the tree. You got to cut back living wood. And what has Richard been doing? He's not been pruning at all. He's just been fertilizing, 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 so to speak. So, he goes on and talks about pruning. Superfluous branches we lop away. What would the superfluous branches be? All those flatterers sucking up to Richard. Had he done so, himself had borne the crown which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What? You think the king shall be deposed? <laughs> Depressed he is already. Punning, Shakespeare's punning on that word depressed because they had the same meaning that we have for being depressed today. Only there, then, they called it melancholy. But to be depressed means what? It's not just you're sad or lonely. Think about it. You are pressed. You are being pushed down. You are being crushed by what? Everything. 
think sane. If you're really depressed, if you're suicidal, you don't think you can lift that weight. You don't think you can ever change whatever the situation is. Okay? Depressed he is already. And deposed his doubt he will be. The queen, how dare you even say such things with your rude, meaning low, common, base, vulgar tongue. You shouldn't be talking about the king like this. King Richard, the gardener goes on, is in the mighty hold of Bolingbrook. Their fortunes both are weighed. They, they are in a balance, in a scales. In your Lord's scale is nothing but himself and some few vanities that make him light. But in the balance of great Bolingbrook, notice, great Bolingbrook, besides himself are what? All the English peers. Gardner is saying, Bolingbroke has what on his side? All the nobility. And with that odds, he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London and you'll find it so. Act 4. Bolingbroke comes in. He calls forth Badgett. Says, what do you know of Gloucester's death? Who wrought it? Next three words. With the king. And who performed the bloody office of his timeless end? So now Bolingbroke is suggesting, take that back, he's not suggesting, he's saying, the king is responsible. He plotted Gloucester's death. He didn't do the actual deed himself. He would be, in today's language, if this went to court, an indicted co-conspirator. Okay. Badgett, bring O'Merrill. O'Merrill comes forward, and Badgett says, My lord O'Merrill, I heard you say, is not my arm of length that reaches from the restful English court as far as Calais to mine uncle's head. Amongst much other talk that very time, I heard you say that you would rather refuse the offer of a hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England. Notice, he adds on the little bit about Bolingbroke's return to England. Why? Because Bolingbroke's right there, and that's like whipped cream on top of the pie. That's the icing on the cake. Yes, I heard Almerrill say, my arm reaches even to Calais and my uncle's head. I'm responsible for his death. Oh, and he didn't want you to come back, by the way. Additional black mark. Almerrill, and then we get a whole bunch of gauges being thrown down again. They love throwing down gauges. <laughs> Throws down his gauge. There's my gauge, the manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell. I say thou last, and will maintain what thou hast said is false. In thy blah, blah, blah. Bolingbroke, badge it for bear, thou shalt not take it up. Well, woo, who does he think he is? You see, Badgett's Superior? As, as a nobleman. No. Badgett's a nobleman. They're equals. What's he acting like? King. Armero. Accepting one, I would he were the best in all this presence that hath moved these cells. So Fitzwater throws down his gauge and says... There's my gauge, our Merrill, engaged to thine. By that first son, which shows me where thou stands, I heard thee say, in vauntingly, that is, and you boasted. Thou spakest it, that thou art cause of noble Gloucester's death. If you deny it twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy false into thy heart. Thou Merrill takes up the gauge. Okay? Percy, our Merrill, thou liest, throws down his gauge. Per now, Merrill's going to end up with a whole bunch of gauntlets in his arm by the end of this whole scene, you know. He's going to have a whole bunch of men to fight. Okay, he takes up the gauge. They argue back and forth. Sorry, skip a bit. Fitzwater takes up the gauge. He throws down a gauge. Now, Merrill borrows a gauge because he's run out. He's only got two hands, you know. He throws down his. Okay. Bolingbroke, line 87. These differences shall all rest under gauge till Norfolk be repealed. 
We're going to bring Thomas Mowbray, Mowbray back. Why? So he can answer these charges and prove his innocence. What does this tell us about Bolingbrook? Because he was the one who said before, I deny you to your face. There's my gauge up there. Somewhat rational, at least. Somewhat rational? He was maybe wrong before? What else? What do you say about someone who's willing to say, I might have been wrong? Honorable. It's an honorable person. That's a big person, we say. That's not somebody who thinks, hey man, my way or the highway, I am always right, no matter what. Even when I'm wrong, I'm always right, you know. So, repealed he shall be, and though my enemy restored again to all his lands and seigneuries. In other words, Bolingbroke is willing to do what Richard would not. Notice also, by the way, he says, Mowbray will be repealed. His banishment will be forgiven. Upon whose authority? Is he king? No. But he sure is acting like one. When he is returned against Almero, we will enforce his trial. Okay. So, it will be... Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, and Merrill. Carlisle. Nope, ain't gonna happen. Why? Norfolk's dead. What did he do during his banishment? Did he go off to some faraway land and sit there and just, ooh, that Henry Bullenbrook, I hate him. I hate him, I hate him. It, it, you know, kind of turn into Gollum. No, what did he do? fought in the Crusades. For Jesus Christ and glorious Christian field he fought, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks, and Saracens, and toiled with works of war, retired himself to Italy, and there at Venice gave his body to that pleasant country, country's earth, and his pure soul unto his captain Christ. Notice, he died redeemed. Bolingbroke, is he dead? A little slow there on the uptake there, uh, Henry. As surely as I live, sweet peace conduct his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. Now, this is somebody saying that about his enemy. Guess what? We're going to see the same kind of language, Henry IV, part one. And we'll see it again in other plays, like in Hamlet, right? So, he says, we're still going to have a trial. York comes in. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from Plume Plucked Richard. Why Plume Plucked? Because of the plumes, the idea is, the, the honors that are due the king, those have been removed from him. Think of a peacock. Not a peahen, a peacock. Spreads that fan of uh, tail feathers, right? Well, that's Richard, but with all the tail feathers plucked off. So now he doesn't appear like a mighty king. He comes and with willing soul adopts the heir. Why? Because he doesn't have an heir. And his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, fourth of that name. Now, is that the actual coronation scene? Not literally, but it serves as that. He's saying, Richard abdicates. You are now king. Notice, that's Richard abdicating. That's different than being deposed. Bolingbroke, in God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Again. That line tells people, like my former professor, that's what he was after all along. Because if he never really wanted the throne, what should he say at this point? Are you kidding? I don't want that problem. No, it's Richard's. 
but he's been acting how? He's been acting like he does want that problem. Okay? Carlisle, God forbid. No. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard? Then true noblesse would learn and forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sub sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? It's suddenly like Carlisle, who's been there for all that's happened previously. You know, where Henry says, we're going to call back Mowbray and such. The light dawns on him. What? You mean you want to be king? Well, you can't. And show the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, that's the king, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? What is he saying Richard at least has the right to? Okay. i got to be real careful here. What does the Constitution guarantee Everyone, too, if they are accused of something. Okay, a trial. And at that trial, what can happen? Okay, what else? Jury and your peers. That comes from Magna Carta. The trial comes from Magna Carta, by the way. A right to face your accuser. You have the right to face your accuser. Okay. Again, and that comes from the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, that face your accuser often meant in battle. You prove yourself that way. When that battlefield kind of confrontation gets transferred to the courtroom kind of confrontation, you don't battle with physical might, you battle with intellectual might, and facts. Okay? And I'll just throw this out there because it pisses me off to no extent. And that's what needs to happen in the current situation with the Supreme Court nominee. If you're going to be accused of something, you have a right to face that accuser. If she's not going to go and sit in front of a Senate hearing with the Klieg lights like he has had to do, that accusation should be thrown out. Stop there. So, notice what he's saying. Richard's not even here. And he's, he's what? <laughs> he's being deposed. Okay. He says, no, Richard should be here. Um, I lost my place. And he himself not present. Oh, for offended God that in a Christian climate, that is, we are a Christian country, 1399. They wouldn't say that today. Souls refined, that is, Christian souls, should show so heinous black obscene a deed. It goes against the very fabric and tradition of the country. I speak to subjects. Who? York? Bolingbroke? Northumberland? Stirred up by God thus boldly for his king, my lord of Hefford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hefford's king. And I think when he says Hefford's king, he means the, the actual land that is the dukedom. Right? Bolingbroke isn't adequately... I'm going to use an anachronistic term because it applies for us. It didn't apply for them. Representing Hefford. Okay. And if you crown him, let me prophesy. The blood of English shall manure the ground and future ages grown for this foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels and in this seat of peace tumultuous wars shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit and this land be called the field of Golgotha. Why Golgotha? Why was it named that? The place of the skull. And dead men's skulls. Oh, if you raise this house, notice the spelling, R-A-I-S-E, but its pronunciation also suggests what? 
R-A-Z-E. If you destroy this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it. Resist it. Let it not be so. He's saying, please, God in heaven, don't let this happen. Northumberland. All right, you've had your say. <laughs> and for your pains of capital treason, capital, it's a capital offense. Really? Uh, did he have his trial? <laughs> did he have a jury of his peers? No. We arrest you here. So Carlisle's taken into custody. And later on disappears. <laughs> Bolingbroke, fetch hither Richard. Fetch. It's not, you know, would you ask the king to please come in? It's bring him that in common view he may surrender. Surrender how? Willfully? Or is this forced? Proceed without suspicion. So Richard comes in. He says, Alack, why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherein I reigned? I'm still king, he's saying. <laughs> I still think like a king. I, sh I shouldn't be fetched. You don't fetch Queen Elizabeth. You don't say, fetch Lizzie. Tell her to come here. I don't know. Maybe Prince Philip does. But I doubt it. I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, to flatter, to bow, and bend my knee. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Why to insinuate? I don't know how to flatter like all of you lowly people do. That's what he means. <sighs> Yet, yeah, well, I remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometimes cry, Oh, hail to me? So Judas did to Christ. <whistles> he just called them all Judas. Judas's. Traitor, yes. But Judas, A plus in traitor class. I mean, he just nailed that one. In fact, if you've read Dante, <laughs> what do you get in Dante? Down there at the very lowest pit of hell, who's there? Judas? Et tu, Brute? Brutus? not Cassius. Judas, Brutus, man, I just taught Dante last fall. Totally drawing a blank. Well, and Satan, obviously. The granddaddy of them all. So, um, but he in 12 found truth in all but one. I in 12,000 none. And there's that idea again. I've been kind of pointing out my Intro to Lit Course, we did Midsummer Night's Dream and Hamlet. And what do we hear in Midsummer Night's Dream? What does Puck say to Oberon about truth, fidelity, in love among men? One in a million. We're going to hear in Hamlet, there is truth, honesty, among men, one in 10,000. Well, here we get one in 12,000. Shakespeare... Because it's not just these three plays. This comes up repeatedly. This idea that you will find one in something to the nth degree. True, honest, faithful, loyal. Why? Shakespeare seems to have a hang-up with that issue. Or maybe he really is a secret, you know, Calvinist in kind of non-denominational clothing and thinks everybody is just fully rotten. I don't think so, but we'll talk about that later. God save the king. Will no man say, Amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, Amen. Because the priest says, God save the king, and the clerks, everybody else says, Amen. 
So God save the king, although I be not he, and yet amen, if heaven do think him me. <laughs> if God thinks I'm the king, well then, amen. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer. Notice, York is saying, you got tired of the crown. You were fed up with it. You offered it, how? Willingly. Freely, the resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. But in the English historical tradition, there's no proviso for that. There's no clause in the unwritten constitution that says, should the monarch grow tired of being monarch, he or she may abdicate. Which is why it's a problem here, which is why it's a problem at the beginning of King Lear. Even though King Lear is set in pre-Christian Britain. The play opens with what? Lear decides, I'm tired of being king. I don't want to be king anymore. And when he breaks off himself from the kingship, that whole great chain of being... So we're going to see, because of the deposition of Richard, the deposing of Richard, that chain of beans is going to fall apart because what is going to immediately happen? <clears throat> Civil war. Okay. So Richard, give me the crown. He takes it. So the crown is here. Give me the crown. Somebody takes it, hands it to him. He goes here. Friend. Yours. Done. All right. Seize the crown. He doesn't do what I just did. Set it down in front of him. He says, take it. Because what does that imply? Kind of. What else? If this were a real installation of a monarch, that crown wouldn't be handed... It would be, that is, appointing. Here, take it. Come on. You want it. I know you want it. Is You've been right? wanting this for a long time. Is that implying that Bolingbroke would have to anoint himself if he wanted to be king? That's implying that there would be no anointing at all. Because the crown forcibly taken is not given. It's not grace. You can't take grace from God. So, come on. On this side, my hand, and on that side, thine. What does that imply? There'd be a bit of tug of war there. Because <laughs> Richard's like, no, 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 no. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets, filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my grease whilst you mount up on high. I thought you'd been willing to resign. It's like Bolingbroke's goat. You mean you don't want to? Really? After all this? You're not going to give it to me? My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. In other words, you can take my crown, but that doesn't take what away from me? My sorrow. Your cares, oh, Bolingbroke, part of your cares you give me with your crown. What part? His responsibility. Not such an insignificant part, right? Think about, let's leave Richard aside for a second. Think about the cares, the responsibility of the presidency. They're not minor, right? They're life and death. For many people, not the least of all United States citizens. But, you know, if the president, because of some impending thing, has to launch, you know, some kind of military action, what does that mean? Not only the military on our side, but all the people on the other side, the receiving end. That's pretty powerful stuff. It's not by some that when Constantine the Great accepted Christianity as the official 
religion or or made Christianity a legal religion. Um, he didn't become a Christian himself until he was on his deathbed, on his deathbed. And there's some anecdotal, anecdotal evidence that Constantine said, I couldn't be emperor and a Christian at the same time. Because the emperor has to do things a good Christian cannot do. Just, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> but I had to. I had to launch wars. I had to, you know, etc. So, part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. That is, the cares you are going to take on yourself, don't remove my cares from me. My care is loss of care. Apparently, some former presidents, when they become former presidents, one of the hardest things they have to deal with. George H.W. Bush talked about this. Bear in mind, he only served four years. Right? He wanted to serve eight, but he was not reelected. Was thinking of all the things he had wanted to do but didn't get done. And even those who have served eight have talked about we didn't achieve what we wanted to achieve. So, your care is gain of care by new care one. The cares I give I have, though given away. They tend the crown yet still with me. So, you're, you're, you're willing to resign. I, no. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> For I must nothing be. If I give up the crown, Richard's saying I become what? Zilch. Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. And he takes off the crown and he lays down the scepter. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway. Almost. From out my heart with mine own tears I wash away my balm with mine own hands I give away my crown. Notice, this is all volitional, it sounds like. With mine own tongue, deny my sacred state. With mine own breath, release all duteous oaths. All pomp and majesty, I do forswear. My manners rinse. Revenues, I forego. The king, the monarch, was the largest landholder in England. Actually, I take that back. It might have been the church and the king was the second largest. My acts, decrees, and statutes, I deny. That is, all the things that I issued as decrees are gone. You know, modern day executive orders. It'd be like when Obama, when Trump was sworn, sworn in, the very last thing before Trump was sworn in, Obama had to, all the executive orders, gone. Right? God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. It is yours. Why? Because you swore allegiance to me. God keep all vows unbroke are made to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved, and thou with all please, thou hast all achieved. Long mayst thou live in Richard's seat to sit. In other words, even when you sit in the big seat at the big table with the big kids, it's my chair. It's almost like he carved his name in it. And soon lie Richard in an earthly pit. God save King Henry, unkinged Richard says. So, Northumberland gives him a paper. Why? Because everything you just said isn't good enough. What do you have to do? Okay, put it in writing. What else? These are your crimes. You got to admit to these. Okay? Richard, must I do so? Must I ravel out my weaved up follies? In other words, do I really have to show what an ass I've been? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> you do. On CNN even, you know. So, we get the end of that scene, and Bolingbroke tells Richard he shall have leave to go. Then give me leave to go. Bolingbroke, whither? That is, eh, it depends. Where are you going to go? Whither you will, so I were from your sights. That is, wherever you want me to, as long as I'm not around you. I just don't want to see you. Go, some of you, convey him to the tower. Never good words to hear. Okay? 
Richard, oh good, convey, conveyors are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. In other words, you dukes, you nobles, you've become conveyors. Simple henchmen, okay? The abbot and Carlisle speak and the abbot fr um, finishes and we'll stop with this. My Lord, before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper. I'll lay a plot shall show us all a merry day. Okay? That's the abbot of Westminster, the bishop of, excuse me, that's the abbot speaking to Carlisle and O'Merrill. All right, we'll finish this on Tuesday, I promise. <laughs> Have to read the schedule again? <laughs> Shush. <laughs>